We're going to continue on with our program with our next uh, featured speaker, George Kane. George is a uh, professor at, in Connecticut. He teaches uh, criminal justice, and he's also a, you're currently a, sheriff, a um, police commissioner, sorry, current police commissioner, a former uh, proponent of the death penalty, now advocates against the death penalty in uh, Delaware and New Hampshire and Florida. And so um, we invite and we welcome and we recognize George Kane. Thank you very much, George. With these wonderful people and all you wonderful people for the last, coming up on a year now, as we've uh, been uh, going across the state trying to uh, gather support and to, no pun intended, load our guns with the bullets uh, to begin the campaign down here. And uh, one of the things that um, I've started off my presentations with um, is that I characterize myself, because I was asked to do that one time, as a pracademic and a convert. A pracademic because um, I've been very fortunate to have a wonderful 32 plus year career in law enforcement. And also, I have a PhD in criminal justice and I teach at the college level. So I've been able to bring those two worlds together, the practical experience and the theoretical and philosophical background. And it really has been a blessing for me because it's opened a lot of doors. And I'll, get, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, I've been very blessed. Um, I've worked with five states in the United States, working currently now with some, as was mentioned earlier, uh, in this abolition uh, campaign. Um, I've been very blessed to be invited to Rome every year since 2012 when Connecticut abolished by the community of Sant'Egidio, and I'll talk a little bit more about them later. I've been to Japan twice, I've been to the Philippines, and um, every time I talk about this stuff, <clears throat> I have to ask myself, how did I get here? How did this happen? And it goes back to that time when I supported capital punishment. If you had told me 15 years ago that I would be where I am today, I would have told you you were crazy. It just was not in the cards for me. I didn't sense it at that point in time. And it's funny because the question I usually get from everyone in these venues and other venues is how could somebody who was working in law enforcement and started out pro-capital punishment become anti-capital punishment? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> and there are a lot of reasons for that, and I promise that I'll touch on a few of them as we move along, but again, I have to tell you, in this venue, in this place, for me, it has everything to do, and it falls back squarely on grace and mercy. Um, just so happens that grace and mercy are the names of my daughter and granddaughter, um, so <laughs> I'm reminded of it every day <laughs> about grace and mercy, and that's a good thing, and uh, Marilyn and I are on our knees for both of them every day. Please pray for them um, as they struggle through their difficult times in their life right now. Um, but grace and mercy have been a tremendous, tremendous um, aspect of my life in more ways than one. Um, so, so God has, I think, brought me on this journey. People ask me all the time, well, when did you change? And when I think about <clears throat> when I changed, I can't really pinpoint it to a certain date. And I think primarily because it was a journey. It did not happen overnight. It was a number of different things that happened at the same time, including a tremendous amount of conviction and changes that were going on in my spiritual life. And now I know looking back on it that that was what was driving everything and has brought me to where I am today. Um, I never really thought much about the dignity of life. When I was working as a probation officer, I worked as an adult probation officer in a felony supervision unit. I never thought much about the dignity of life. I never thought about people who were charged with capital crimes or who would be sentenced to death or would be executed. I never really gave it much thought. Murderers? I, I didn't think much about them. And um, it's funny, I guess, because 
where I am now through this journey, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I can't stop thinking about those people on death row. So that in and of itself is a huge, huge change for me. Um, so how did this happen? Well, um, I guess I could say that one of, the, one of the beginning things that happened in my life was I, I got a master's degree in counseling from the same university that I got, I got my undergraduate degree in criminal justice, Western Connecticut State University. And as soon as I got my master's degree, the department chairman asked me if I would teach a course because they needed somebody to teach corrections. They had nobody teaching corrections courses at the time. And I was working as a probation officer at the time, and I guess that was the closest thing to a person in corrections, which I was. And so I said, okay. And I was pro-capital punishment at the time, but I was wise enough, or at least maybe the Holy Spirit was <laughs> making me wise enough to realize that if you're going to be teaching this stuff to students, you better know both sides. So I had some work cut out for me because I knew part of the curriculum is that I'd be teaching about capital punishment. And I thought as I began to study and I began to read, this is going to be easy. I mean, I supported capital punishment. Why wouldn't anybody support capital punishment? And here I am walking in as a law enforcement officer. We all support capital punishment. This is going to be a piece of cake. And I thought to myself, I work in the best criminal justice system in the world. We're better than any other country in the world, I thought. And to some extent, I still believe. We don't make mistakes, I thought. And if it came to the death penalty, certainly my government my country, my criminal justice system that I work in would make sure that if we were going to kill somebody, we were going to dot every I and cross every T and give every person the utmost constitutional protection that they're entitled to. And no innocent person would be executed, ever. Not in my country. Sound familiar? So I began to read, and what I began to find out absolutely horrified me. And I started with a Supreme Court case in 1972 of Furman versus Georgia, when then United States Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall wrote opinion, his opinion, which called for the abolition of capital punishment. And it was a highly sharply divided court in that decision, but Marshall wrote something that really grabbed my attention because I read a commentary on it before I actually read the decision. And what's now referred to as the Marshall Hypothesis, Justice Thurgood Marshall said, in effect, that if people knew the truth about capital punishment, they would never be able to support it. He came right out and said it. But the problem is, is that capital punishment is hidden from all of us, and it's done purposely. And I began to read the some 680 pages of that decision, and I'm, sh I'm shaking my head and scratching my head saying, what? This is in the 1980s, so I'm reading a decision that was about 15 years old, and I, I see Justice Marshall writing about his concerns. Now keep in mind that this was in the 1980s that I read it, and the decision was in 1972. And he basically said there were three things that really concerned him about capital punishment. Number one, the risk of executing an innocent person, he wrote back then, is too great a price to pay for us as Americans. And we would execute an innocent person. Now, this was before the studies were done. And what do we know today? Over 154 people have been sentenced to death and then taken off because of evidence of their innocence. He didn't know that back then. We know it now. He also said that the death penalty would be discriminatory. 
not just racial, but it is, especially down here, but class. Those without the capital get the punishment. Hmm? And what do we know now? The studies that have been done since that time. We know that the death penalty is discriminatory. He didn't have those studies back then. And the last thing he said, and probably the most important thing, well, they're all important, was that having a death penalty would wreak so much havoc through the entire criminal justice system that the system would fall apart. We would be causing pain and agony to everyone even remotely involved in the process. Do I need to say anything more about that? You've heard it today. It would cause such a problem, he wrote back then, we wouldn't know what to do. Well, in 1972, the critics of Thurgood Marshall didn't like what he had to say. They called him a fool because he had nothing to back it up. Today, they're calling him a prophet. And I believe he was. He was a modern-day prophet in 1972. And he was a very spiritual man. Who I heard that the grapevine, maybe wrong, at one point did support capital punishment. So he had a transformation as well. So I thought about this. You know, in everything that we've learned, there is a wonderful book that I'm going to point out to you. Well, there's a few wonderful books I have here. Oh, I forgot to tell you. You know, the grace and mercy part? Well, here's the grace, and here's the mercy. <laughs> Two very good books. This one's written by Cardinal Casper. Well, excellent book. Um, another good one is written by a very dear friend of mine by the name of Bob Bohm. Some of you in this room know Bob. Bob is a professor of criminal justice at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. He's become a very good friend of mine, a colleague. We've done research together, and we continue to present every year um, at our national conference. And uh, Bob wrote a book a couple of years ago that got published, and it's called Capital Punishment's Collateral Damage. And I want you to take a look at the cover. They say you can't judge a book by its cover. Yes, you can. Shame. Shame on us that we fail to recognize the trauma and pain that we cause to every single person involved in the capital process from the beginning to the end and beyond. Police, homicide detectives, prosecutors, judges, jurors, corrections officers, probation officers, parole officers, journalists, appellate court judges, everyone becomes a victim of this process. And what this book does systematically through a wonderful series of interviews and a methodology that nobody can question, I nominated this book for the book of the year in our academy this year. I don't know, they're not going to announce it until next month in Denver. Everyone is traumatized by this process. And as Dale would say many, many times, and he said it before, why are we doing this and who are we doing this for? Nobody wins. There's another book I'm going to tell you about later. but Yes. This is uh, Bob Bohm, Carolina Academic Press, Capital Punishment's Collateral Damage. It's a great read. I've learned throughout the years, as many in this room have, that when it comes to capital punishment, we live in a world of myths and lies. And we heard about that this morning. And it's a theme that I want to go back to. The death penalty is based purely on myths and lies. One of the things that we talk about as we've been going through this great state of Florida, we've come up with a little like buzzwords. 
Moore came up with one, I love it. Stories and statistics. And the more you know about capital punishment, the less you like it. And it's the truth. There are a lot of resources that we can look to to help us and guide us. There's some new ones that have just come out. Pope Francis just wrote a book on mercy. There's a new book that just came out on Catholic teaching and capital punishment. I have those in my folder. If I had them, I can, I can let you know afterwards. But I want to talk to you a little bit now about how I got into this and what I'm doing. You can probably imagine that I'm not the most popular guy among my law enforcement buddies. This thin blue line, hmm? this brotherhood that we're a part of, not very popular. But because I have the badge, I have to tell you, I have the ability to talk to people. I've been invited into certain venues. Thank you, Lord. And when I sit down and I start to talk, at first it's... <laughs> but what I've learned in this process and this is something that we have learned here in Florida as we've done the talking around here, is that talking to groups is great, but it's those one-to-one -one conversations that you have with people afterwards that really make a difference. And it's so important. So you know what? Maybe we're, peach we're preaching to the choir, but one of the things we've learned as we've been talking to the choirs this last year is that we need to be educated. And people have told us in the one-to-ones, what do I need to look at? What do I need to read? What do I, ne what do I need to know? And as people of faith, I would suggest in this room, get to know our Catholic teaching. I'm going to give you the name of a book that was just published, Catholic Teaching and the Death Penalty. We do need to know, and Dale has written a wonderful book. Sorry, Dale, I'm going to embarrass you here now for a little bit. The biblical truth about America's death penalty. Some of you may know about it. Adele, are there any copies left of this anymore? Or are they all? No, it's still in print. Still in print, okay. You got to get this one, folks. It's scholarly, it's deep, but it's the truth. How many years, Dale? Did you do the research? We need to know the tenets of our faith and the root of why we believe what we do, if we don't know that, we're not going to be able to preach the word. We are not going to be able to end capital punishment here in the state of Florida. This may be a small group of people, but if everybody in this room commits themselves to learning and being an agent of God's word and the truth that we have come to know about the horrors of killing people. We already know it through abortion. The death penalty is right there. I uh, want to tell you a little bit about the study that I'm working on. And I thought I was about to get ready to publish the paper later this year until I had a conversation with Dick Dieter, who's the uh, director of the National Death Penalty Information Center in Washington the other day. George, Terry, my colleague, I think you need to do a little bit more work because the message can be better. We surveyed five states, including Florida. We looked at the top five states that execute people. And we said, let's take a look at the law enforcement officers who were killed in the line of duty. And let's see what's happening to those cases. Because what's the hue and cry from law enforcement officers? We need capital punishment to keep us safe. It's a deterrent to murder. No, it's not. And we're working on the study right now that's going to give us the numbers and we've got to do some more statistical analysis. We have to look at rates, homicide rates before, homicide rates after. We're going to include states that have abolished capital punishment, looked at the homicide rates before, looked at the homicide rates after. But what we've done so far, raw numbers. Five states, including the state of Florida. We said, okay, if it's a deterrent, 
it's got to be applied, it's got to be used, and it's got to be carried out. Otherwise, it's not a deterrent. We found in the five states that we looked at, including Texas and Florida, and the states that have the, the, the highest number of, of uh, executions, law enforcement, law enforcement officer cases where they're, that come to an arrest, and some of them don't, but when they come to an arrest, charging decisions, jury sentence, jury recommendation, 37% of cop killers get capital punishment. Now, that's higher than the general population, for sure. But it is extremely difficult to make a case that it's a deterrent to crime when one in three people who kill cops end up with a sentence of death and killed. It's ridiculous. The sentence of death, excuse me. This doesn't happen. So, when I was talking to Dick on the phone the other day as we were kind of wrapping up the conversation, he said to me, and this confirms what I just said earlier, he says, you know what, George, I hope you're getting out there and talking about what you're doing. Talk to groups, but when you're done with the groups, pull people aside one-to-one -one and have that conversation with them. And I can't tell you how many law enforcement groups I've spoken to across the United States. When I've been in a room like this, nobody says much, but afterwards I've had a number of people come up to me and say to me, you know, you're right. Death penalty is really stupid. Why didn't you say that in the group? And that's part of the problem. We have to make people feel comfortable with being able to talk about what they know to be true. We talked about ambivalence before, right? How it wasn't on the radar. It's our job to help to put it on the radar. It needs to be on the radar. Dale said earlier, and I mentioned a little bit before, that the death penalty leaves no survivors. And what it does to good people. I've read that book. I've heard Dale speak. I've been doing this for a long time now. Something happened a couple of weeks ago. I was down speaking, invited by uh, Jim Grevenitis, who's the assistant director of deacons for the Diocese of Tampa, St. Pete. He invited me to come down to speak. Ingrid, Ingrid here yet, by the way? There she is. Hey, Ingrid. Ingrid was there. And I spoke to the deacons there. And I forgot that after I was going to speak, that Deacon Peter Andre was going to say a few words. And I was talking about the collateral damage. I was talking about the trauma, PTSD, and how it spreads through the entire system. And after lunch, Peter came up and spoke a few words, and he looked a little upset when he first stood up there. And he said, you know, before I share what I'm going to share, I have to tell you something. He said, when George was up before talking about collateral damage and traumatic experiences and PTSD, he said, I was sitting in the back of the room over there, and I got to tell you, I started to shake. I got sick to my stomach and I was sweating like a dog. I didn't realize at first what was happening. I thought it was maybe something I ate that morning. He said, then God showed me. I've been traumatized by the work that I do. I need help. So it isn't just the people that we can think of that might, even be, that, that might be adversely affected the people that are right in the core of doing the work, God's work, are traumatized. And we need to be renewed. We need to be holding on to Christ. So this happens a couple of weeks ago. Two weeks later, I'm talking in a small church up in Burlington, Connecticut, a men's group, a Catholic men's group, and I'm talking to them, and most of the people at the end of the talk were very gracious and thankful and understanding, and oh yeah, we need to do more, and there was a couple of deacons in the parish priest was there as well. Well, I looked out of the corner of my eye at one point, and I saw a couple of people off to the side. And I thought, oh boy. 
I can't tell you what they said to me. It was the most personal, insulting, degrading conversation I have ever had with anyone in my entire life about what I was talking about. I couldn't even get a word in edgewise if I could even open my mouth. And I had a hard time doing that. I was dizzy. I walked out to my car at the end and I sat and had to put my head back in the car. And I remember saying to the Lord, I'm done. I'm done with this stuff. I can't do this anymore. That's how affected I was. And it wasn't until a few days later. I mean, I came home and I said, Marilyn, I was like, what happened? <laughs> I had to pull the car off the side of the road after I drove for about a mile and a half. I was still dizzy. I was traumatized. And those of us who are doing this work, and who better than Dale and those of you that are working in this prison ministry, I am preaching to the choir, I'm sorry. But let's call it for what it is. This work is not for the faint of heart. And it requires a deep commitment to Christ and a transformation of our spirits on a regular basis. I thought I had it pretty well together. And I talked to this guy, and in 15 minutes, I was ready to walk away. The evil one. Hmm? I remember standing at this very place in this room last year talking about spiritual warfare and the importance of understanding what we are up against. This, brothers and sisters, is a matter of life and death. And if we're representing life, who is the author of death? And he ain't happy about what we're doing. The good news. The victory's already been won. Do you know that? Do you believe that? The victory has already been won. And I needed to let Jesus speak that to my heart when I pulled that car off the side of the road after driving a mile and a half. And I'm saying, drive. I'm done. Can't do this anymore. Finished. I know it was an attack. And I had to bring myself right back. Whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It took me three days before I started to feel normal again. I had a headache for three straight days. But I came back with a vengeance. Not the kind of vengeance we're talking about. That's that negative stuff. <laughs> This is the good vengeance. This is Satan, get thee behind me. No, there is too much more work to be done. I want to tell you a couple of stories about how when we bring ourselves and we bring our, our hearts into the commitment to this kind of work, and when we're prayerful, and when we're open to the Lord showing us things, how much of a difference we can make. And there are people in this room, I know that I'm standing up here today, you're called. You're called. There's more. There's more for each and every one of us. And if we pray and we seek, we'll find. I, um, a year ago this week, I was in Orlando at our Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences Conference, and I was doing a presentation with Bob Bohm uh, on what's happening. Actually, my presentation was what's happening down here in Florida. And um, prior to our workshop, there was a workshop that the Innocence Project had put on. Are you familiar with the Innocence Project? Yeah. Yeah. People that work to set people free from death row. And, and many of you know Juan Melendez. He was there. He was one of the panelists. And they were talking about their experiences of having been wrongfully convicted, wrongfully incarcerated, wrongfully sentenced to death, and then released. I've heard one probably four or five times. I actually brought him to Connecticut before we abolished in 2012. The other two guys I hadn't heard before. But I remember sitting there, and Marilyn was with me, and I, I just felt my heart was breaking watching these people pour their hearts out. 
And the pain is just still right there, you know? It's like, what, how can we do this to people? And they were talking about how they had gone through the court process, the interrogation process, cops lying, prosecutors withholding evidence, and sentencing them to death for a crime they didn't commit. And I'm sitting there cringing. And all I could do was just pray for them. And I was. And then all of a sudden as I was praying and listening to them and just watching this, this, this avalanche of pain and people in the audience were just kind of like, this stuff really happens? And I just felt God speak into my heart. And I felt, I heard it very strongly. I don't hear a lot of things really strong in my life, but this I felt strongly. You need to apologize to them. And I thought, what did I do? I didn't do anything wrong. And I remember, I think I turned to Marilyn and I said, Marilyn, I think God's asking me to apologize. And she said, yeah, yeah, you should. What did I do? And, and then as I prayed, it came clear to me. And at the end of their presentation, I stood up and I said, <laughs> it's kind of funny, I said, before I start, I wanted to lay the ground, I said, I'm currently a police commissioner, I've got 32 years of law enforcement experience. Everybody in the room goes, like, what is he going to say? And I said, I just want to make sure I get this right. You've been up here talking about how you guys were wronged, from the beginning, and you're still wrong because these guys, none of them got compensation. <clears throat> these guys that were, that were taken off death row and released back into society, you know, if you're paroled for a murder, you get social services, hmm? you get benefits, you get support. If you're wrongfully convicted, it's see ya and don't let the door hit you on the way out. And I said, you've spoken a lot of things, and I want to thank you for sharing your life. But there's one thing that I didn't hear from you. The one thing I didn't hear from you was that anyone in either of the three cases, I want to make sure I got this right because maybe you just forgot to say it. Did anybody apologize to you for what happened to you? And they looked at each other like they were deer in the headlights. Nope. One guy said, well, I won't say it because I'm here in Florida, Something else, no. <laughs> and I said, well, you know what? I got something to say to you. On behalf of all of us in law enforcement who try to do the right thing and to make sure that we arrest the guilty and protect the innocent and to do the job the best of our ability, I want to apologize to what for what happened to you because it never should have happened to you. There were probably 150, 180 people in the room. The room broke out in applause, and these guys started crying. And I sat back down. I remember I looked at Marilyn, and I said, geez, I guess I was supposed to apologize to him. <laughs> Nobody had ever apologized to them. You think this relates to capital punishment? What is God trying to bring us to in this year of mercy? I was, uh, I take my students to prison every semester. Maximum security prison in Newtown. Yeah, the Newtown where the shootings occurred. I've been doing this for 30 years. I, you know, I'm, I'm about to become involved in prison ministry and somebody said to me before, as I told them I did this, I take my students there, well, you already are, already are involved in prison ministry. Let me tell you what happened. Last time I went up there, there's a program called Turning Point, and the inmates meet with all the students, and they talk to them, and they share with them. And then we break into small groups. We had this one guy who, uh, and these, these people, they're, they're repentant. These, see, these are the people that we want to have released, you know, eventually. They are able to be released. Turn their life around. They've committed themselves to spreading a word of how they got in trouble to prevent other people from getting the same, making the same mistakes that they did. And this guy is... He's tattooed, front and back on his arms. And we were in a small group, and we were kind of talking. And it kind of reached a little bit of a lull. And I'm not a big tattoo guy. 
So I just thought I would talk to him. And I said, so usually people that have tattoos, there's like a story behind them. And I said, tell me about your tattoos. Because I noticed on the right side of his top of his arm, he had time is, and on this forum, he had money. Time is money. I said, what does that mean? He said, Dr. Kane, he said, I was one of the biggest drug dealers in Bridgeport. I was president of a gang. I was making so much money hand over foot, and I, my message to the people was, don't get in my way, because time is money. <sighs> and then I noticed underneath his arms, he had other tattoos. And one of them was a picture of Jesus. And one of them was a tattoo of uh, a person. And I said, who was that? He says, that's my grandfather. My poor grandfather who had, was alive and had to watch me, you know, go to prison for killing somebody. And I said, well, what about that other one? It was Jesus. He said, I, I don't know why I put that one on. And I said to him, well, I do. And I grabbed both of his forearms. The correctional officer that was there was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I grabbed the top of his forearms. And I said to him, Bill, this is the old you. Time is money. And then I flipped him upside down. And I said, this is the new you. And his mouth dropped. And the correctional counselor that was in the group said, See, Bill, I told you, God is moving in your life. God is trying to change you. This is a confirmation. The point I'm making about this story is all we need to do is be open, and the Holy Spirit will create the openings for us to spread messages of love to those who are imprisoned, to people that need to be set free. We can be those people. People? How am I doing on time? Five minutes. Okay. One last story. I mentioned earlier that uh, not always the most welcome people in my law enforcement group of friends. Um, but I was at a, uh, my police department's uh, PBA Christmas party about four years ago. Well, five years ago now. And uh, we had our dinner, and uh, after dinner we were uh, hanging out by the uh, <clears throat> beverage station. And one of my officers comes up to me, who I've known for years, and he's a great guy. He's a, just a wonderful-hearted guy. He retired now. And he said to me, George, I've got to ask you a question. You, you're really into this anti-death penalty stuff, huh? And I said, yeah, I am. He goes, I don't get it. I, can you tell me something? I, he's a good guy. Tell me. Explain to me how you can be in this business and be against capital punishment. I don't get it. And he was being honest. And I said, Tim, let me ask you a question. I said, do you doubt that if anything were ever to happen to you, and you were killed, that I would do everything in my power to make sure that your wife and kids were taken care of. And he said, of course, Commissioner. I know you would do that. This is what we do for each other. We take care of each other. We're, we're brothers and sisters in this business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know that. I said, OK. Then I've got a favor to ask you. And his expression changed. And he looked at me. He said, what's that? I said, I want you to promise me that if I'm ever killed, you will make sure that my killer does not get capital punishment. And he looked at me. He said, what? I said, do I need to repeat it? He said, no, I heard you. Why would you want me to do that for you? I said, Tim. We both know how this system works. And if I were ever killed, 
They would seek capital punishment, and my wife and my daughter would be dragged through a system for years and years and years that would promise them closure. And you're going to feel better when it's all over. And every time that case came up for review or an appeal was filed, whose picture would be in the paper? Not mine. No. I don't want my wife and daughter to go through that. So please, do me a favor and promise me that if I'm ever killed, that you'll make sure that my killer doesn't get capital punishment. And he looked down and he shook his head. He said, wow, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. We still have a discussion. We still have a relationship today. And every time, he's, he does, he, now he does an uh, airport service, and every time we go back and forth in the airport, he always brings it up with me. George, how are you doing with this anti-death penalty stuff? Yeah, you know, I remember when we talked about it years ago, and I've thought about it a lot since, and... Yeah, you're right. You're right. It makes a lot of... You're right. You're right. So we still have that dialogue going. So in closing, that there is plenty of work to be done in this great state of Florida. And you have chosen to be here today. Please pray and consider what your calling is. In a little while, you're going to be given a lot of information about what's going on and the resources that are available the things that will help you to be a better minister of God's word and God's truth in this message of life, in this year of mercy. This is what we're called to. I want to thank you for being here and thank you for letting me be here with you. God bless you all and we're not done yet.